Welcome to the San Francisco Writers Conference podcast, a celebration of craft, commerce, and community. I'm your host, Matthew Felix, and I'm here today with Kirsten Valdez Quaid. Kirsten is the author of The Five Wounds, which we'll be talking about today. Her previous book, Night at the Fiestas, won the John Leonard Prize from the National Book Critics Circle, the Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and a Five Under 35 Award from the National Book Foundation. Night at the Fiestas was also named a New York Times Notable Book and a Best Book of 2015 by the San Francisco Chronicle and the American Library Association. Kirsten's work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Best American Short Stories, The O. Henry Prize Stories, The New York Times, and lots of other places. She's an assistant professor at Princeton, although I suspect she's due for a promotion. Welcome, Kirsten. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here today. So let's just jump right in and let's talk about your book, The Five Wounds. Uh, can you just give us a high level overview of what the book is about? Yes, so um, the, the novel, The Five Wounds is um, an extension of a short story of the same title that appeared in my collection. And it was originally published in The New Yorker. Um, the story opens during Holy Week in the fictional New Mexico town of Las Penas and um, it centers on Amadeo, who's an unemployed alcoholic who lives with his mother. And Amadeo is a member of a community of penitentes, um, who's, um, it's a lay Catholic community whose um, worship involves physical penance. Um, Amadeo has been chosen to play the role of Jesus in the Good Friday Passion procession. And he is convinced that it will transform his life if he does the best possible performance of Jesus. Um, all of his plans are derailed, though, when his 16-year-old pregnant daughter shows up um, unannounced and tells him that she's moving in with him. So at the end of the short story, um, Amadeo, you know, in trying to do the best performance he can, asks for actual nails to be used in the crucifixion. And he... Um, in the last moments, he has this epiphany, he sees his daughter, he understands that transformation has to come from his recognizing his responsibility toward his daughter and, and sort of stepping up um, as a father. And right. the question for me after I, I finished, you know, after the story was published was, okay, will, would that stick? Does that is that epiphany enough for Amadeo? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I wondered, so what happens the next morning? And um, that's that's where the novel grew from. And it it um, covers the a year in this family's life. It's the first year of the life of Angel's baby. Right. Okay. So you just you just answered my next question. So thanks for that. Because my question was going to be, you know, you had 10, 10 stories, I think, in um, Night of the Fiestas. And so I was kind of curious why out of the 10 stories, you might have chosen this one, you know, what was there that you wanted to explore further, but I, I think you just covered that. So let's uh, talk about the the actual sort of setting and the backdrop for the story itself, because I think there's a lot of elements that are really, I mean, setting is always important, obviously, to a story, to a novel, but I think there are a, a few elements here that are really sort of particularly important that I just wanted to call out before we talk about the story itself. First of all, it's set in uh, New Mexico. I think you already said Las Penas is in New Mexico. Why did you set the novel there? You know, I my... I'm from New Mexico. My extended family is there, and we've, um, you know, our family has a very long history in in that region. And, um, mo you know, most of my fiction is is set in New Mexico. Not all of it, but but most of it. And, you know, that landscape just never fails to confound me. I miss it. I love it. It, it, I have so many questions about it. Um, and it's just filled with story for me mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. conflict. I mean, it's history is one of conflict. And I think that, you know, these deep historical conflicts are still present today. Um, and that it makes it really fertile ground for fiction. Right. Um, you know, and speaking of history, this is the story revolves around a Latinx family and a Latinx community. But something that was interesting to me is that 
uh, Amadeo, one of the protagonists, and his daughter Angel, who you just mentioned, they don't speak Spanish. And I'm not sure if the generation before them, Yolanda and Tio Tive, I assume they spoke Spanish, but I thought that was interesting and sort of tells us a little bit about them and their relationship with their heritage in the community they're living in. Can you speak to that? Yeah, you know, I think it's, this is, um, you know, something that's pretty common, you know, not, not universal, of course, but, you know, these, the Padilla family um, has been in this area for, you know, 400 years. And, right. um, and the younger, as you point out, the younger generations do not speak Spanish. Um, that's certainly the case in my own family. And it's, it's a loss that we really feel. I mean, my my generation and my mother's generation, and we, we talk about it. Um, my grandparents were pretty deliberate in their decision not to speak Spanish to their children. There was a mm -hmm. lot of anxiety. It was the 50s and 60s. There was a lot of anxiety about um, assimilating. You know, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. There were they first generation, your, your grandparents? No, I mean, they've, they've been there. I mean, what people say there is that the, the border moved, not us. Right. Um, you know, right. so they've, they've, the, you know, a lot of these Hispanic New Mexico families have been there for many centuries. Right. Um, so yeah, but you know, my, my grandmother grew up speaking Spanish. She was hit in school for speaking Spanish. Oh, wow. um, there was a lot of shame attached to speaking Spanish and to having an accent when, when she was young. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, and I, I think, it, you know, in the last couple, maybe the last 10, 15 years, um, you know, both of my grandparents anglicized their first names um, mm -hmm. when they were younger. Um, and in the last 15 years or so, you know, my grandfather went back to the name he, he was given. Oh, interesting. With, yeah. with real pride. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there was, there was a real pleasure in reclaiming it, but yeah, for a long time, there was this real anxiety. Right. right. Um, so, but, but, you know, of course now we, we feel the loss. I feel the loss. I was just having a conversation with my aunt and, you know, that it, it does feel like there's this, there's something missing. I mean, right. I grew up with, with bits of family Spanish. I grew up hearing my great grandmother and the older generation speaking. So can probably some understand of it more. Down. Yeah. Yeah. But yep. um, yeah, but it was not the language of, of my childhood. Right. So you mentioned, you know, there's, there's so much history here in, the, in, the, in these communities. And part of that also, we kind of just alluded a little bit to that is, is this intergenerational trauma. And one result of that is, is the drug epidemic. That's also part of this story as well. And there's one quote I want to read that really illustrates that well and sort of heart-wrenching. Um, Yolanda's quote, Yolanda, uh, who again is the grandmother slash mother, depending on the character we're referring to, but Yolanda is glad her aunt Fidelia isn't here to see her son Elwin's story reproduced over and over in houses all through these hills. Passing the syringe is a kind of communion. Sometimes three generations at once, slumped in their living rooms with needles in their arms, eyelids fluttering. So, like I said, that was just that was just heart wrenching. Just this idea of multiple generations sitting around, you know, doing heroin. Um, can you shed a little more light, though, on on the drug the drug epidemic that's facing the community that's that's the the setting for this novel? I mean, it's it's really it's tragic. It's tragic, um, and it's it has its you know. Th there's a really wonderful study of of the opioid epidemic in in that area in Española um, by Angela Garcia called the Pastoral Clinic. And she really spends time with with people who are suffering from this addiction, with people who are involved in some of the rehab efforts. Um, and she, her thesis, she really connects it to um, people being sort of disinherited from the land. I mean, so, you know, the, the, there's the Spanish colonizers came in and it was a, you know, incredibly brutal, um, bloody colonization effort. And, you know, Native, Native American communities were 
horribly oppressed. And, um, and then, you know, in the 19th century, the, the ranch land became, um, you know, this is a, <laughs> a gross, gross simplification, but the Mexican-American War happened. There was the Treaty, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, which said that, you know, the, the land grants from the Spanish crown that were um, acknowledged by Mexico, that they, that the United States would respect those land claims. And it didn't happen. Um, many, many, many of those land grants were um, absorbed, either sold, you know, for shockingly low prices to Anglo ranchers or absorbed by um, BLM land. Um, Your land forest. management, right? Yeah. Um, and so there is this real sense, you know, it, the, it, these land grants used to be communally owned. They were owned by the, the communities. Everybody could graze their sheep or their cows or their horses on it. Um, and, and so the, Angela Garcia's thesis really is that with the loss of this, with the loss of this, this kind of community coherence and, you know, a, a ability to, to live off the land, um, that it left this real vacancy and, right. uh, you know, I think it's a really interesting, really interesting thesis. Um, you know, certainly you see, um, you know, New Mexico has such, such poverty. There's such disparity in in wealth there. You have, you know, movie stars living in Santa Fe and then just terrible, terrible poverty. Right, right. You know, I just did an interview with Natalie Bazile, who has a new book out, We Are Each Other's Harvest. And it talks specifically, the whole book is about the impacts of the, of black farmers and, and black people being disconnected from the land and all of the effects. And there are a couple, she does have a couple of stories there about Latinx um, families and farmers having similar experiences. So that's, I, I love that you make that parallel because because the, 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 our connection to the land is so important and it is so important for the health and prosperity of communities. That's, we could talk for hours about that, but I want to transition to kind of the last element related to this, to the to the setting and the backdrop for the story that's really important. You have already touched on this briefly, but that's that's religion specifically. Though I'm, I'm I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the Hermandades and the Morada, what the Hermandades are and what the Morada is, and sort of their role in in this particular community. Okay, um, yeah. So it's a it's an old old tradition. Um, th these these brotherhoods of penitentes, um, you know, were, were really central to the fabric of village life. Um, and they, they, they really grew out of the fact that these villages were isolated. And so there wasn't a priest for every single village. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes many months would pass before the, the traveling priest would come through. And so, um, these communities would, would, you know, fill that, that function. They served as, um, mutual aid societies, they they buried the dead, and they marked important moments in the liturgical calendar, um, like, um, you know, Holy Week. Um, and, you know, the, the tradition is still alive today. Um, the numbers are much smaller. Um, there was a time in the 19th century, early 20th century, when more um, when Anglos moved in and there were a lot of journalists that were sort of writing about these traditions in um, incredibly, um, I mean, I find horrifying and disparaging ways, painting painting um, these penitentes as, you know, zealots and, mm. you know, strange extremists. And, right. um, and the, the, so the practice really went underground. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, anyone, from the area who lives in the area is aware of that practice. And, um, and I've always found it to be just incredibly moving. Um, you know, I grew up steeped in, in Hispanic Catholicism that, right, you know, right. my great grandmother and grandmother and passed on. And, you know, so this idea of processions and, you know, that it's, it's in me. Um, mm -hmm. And I've just always found, you know, this, the, the practice of the penitentes of, of, you know, the self-flagellation and I, I find it really beautiful and moving and, and a really empathetic way of, of 
marking Christ's suffering, you know, mm-hmm. trying to feel what some of what he felt. Um, and, and I was, so I've, you know, I'm really interested in that. I'm interested in ritual. I'm interested in, you know, the line between community, public um, expressions of faith and pageantry and, um, um, and also, you know, in, in some of, as I was reading about, you know, historical accounts of penitentes, um, there were some, you know, cases alluded to that, oh, you know, so-and-so said that somebody asked for real nails and there was a real crucifixion. And, mm-hmm. you know, these aren't, I, it wasn't common. Um, it's, it, they weren't, you know, especially documented, but right. I was fascinated by that. And I wondered, so, you know, what depth of belief and need and longing must be behind that choice? Okay. And, and so let's talk about, sorry, if I can interrupt, let's transition to Amadeo's experience of that. So when the, when the story starts out, I assumed he was going to be the protagonist. And in a sense, he is a protagonist in the beginning, in the beginning, but then you do end up telling the story from the perspectives of some of the other characters as well. But um, so you've already kind of described him. He's living at home. He's dealing with a lot of shame. He's jobless. He's taken care of by his mom, even though he's 33. Uh, I can't remember if you said, you know, he's got a drinking problem. He's always sort of in the way. Um, and uh, well, first off, his name. Can you tell me what his name means? Because I assume that wasn't that wasn't um, chance that you named him that. Do you know what his name means? I named him after a great great uncle. Okay, interesting. Because his <laughs> name means because I assumed because Amadeo is such an unusual name. I love that name, Amadeo, Amadeus, and Amadeo, but. I thought, well, wait a second. Amard is to love, and Deo is God, so it means lover of God, basically. Oh my so, God, you know, you're would right. Be a, would be a rough translation, <laughs> right? So I assumed that was deliberate. So we're going to edit this podcast, and we're going to tell everyone that you you did that deliberately. But but I thought that was perfect, and it was perfect. You just didn't know it was perfect, because the first line of the novel, of course, is quote: "This year, Amadeo Padilla is Jesus." So lover of God is Jesus, which I thought was sort of perfect. Um, can you tell us a little more, we've alluded to, to, to the procession, but can you tell us a little bit more about what physically is actually involved in this, in this, this, um, this ritual that he's about to partake of in, in the first part of the book? That's really kind of the focus of the first part of the book, um, including, again, what the people are doing behind him. And can, can you just get a little more specific with regards to that ritual? Because it is pretty, pretty powerful. Sure. So um, the, the, um, hermanos are, you know, they go up a hill, um, and they, they're, they're reenacting the passion. So, um, Amadeo carries the cross. Um, some of the other penitentes are behind him, um, you know, hitting flagellating, flagellating. Um, um, and, and some of them are, you know, shouting to Amadeo, um, at, shouting at, at him. Um, and then they get to the top and, um, he, he's tied, tied to the cross and then asks for, for the nails. Right. So he's um, actually and, reenacting the crucifixion I mean, he he's is, going yeah. that far to just, I just want to point that out just kind of plainly because that's, that's how far he's going for people who aren't necessarily familiar with, with what takes place at these rituals. I mean, he's, he's sort of going all the way with, with this. And that, that is never asked of him. That is never modeled for him. He hears a rumor that somebody in generations past did it. And he latches onto that as, as the way to, to change his life, to, to become better. Um, And he specifically says at, I think it's near, near the end of that experience, he says, or no, maybe it's before this experience. Anyway, he says, quote, or he's thinking, quote, total redemption in one gesture, if he can only do it right. So there's, there's so much in that particular sentence, but I mean, that's, we get, couldn't have a clearer understanding of kind of what he's hoping to get out of this experience. And so redemption, obviously, if it's not the most important theme, it's certainly for me as a reader, it was, it was probably the, the, the most important theme that stood out for me as I was reading the book. And I think it's probably fair to say, again, my experience reading your book, that 
that almost every, or not almost, that every single main character in this book is seeking some sort of redemption. So can you tell me a little more, tell us a little more about your interest in that particular theme, this idea of, of redemption? You know, uh, uh, the, the, the sacrament that um, in Catholicism that I've always found the most moving is reconciliation, um, confession, and the idea that you can confess your sins, your wrongdoings, and get absolution and turn a new page, you know, and pledge to do better in the future. That's an important mm -hmm. part of it. Yeah. Um, and I've always found that to be such a, a lovely and and hopeful part of of the of Catholicism um, and so I you know I'm, I'm very I'm I'm interested in how how we make amends to the the people we have hurt in our lives and um, and I mean one thing about that I've I've I would wonder about with confession is okay can you confess and get absolution and promise to do better in the future without actually apologizing for <laughs> to the people you've hurt and mm -hmm. yeah. you know and yeah. that's such an important that that's such an important part of of um you know just being a human in the world you know of course we we are all so flawed and we're constantly hurting each other and stepping on each other's toes. And, and I'm interested in how we move on from that, how we heal from that. Um, Do you think we're, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that of course is, is Amadeo's big task. He has to um, make amends with his daughter and, you know, he's, she's 15 years old at the opening of the book and um, he has spent very little time with her. Right, right. Do you think um, do you think we're all seeking redemption? I mean, do you think that again, the story takes place within the within a context of Catholicism and Christianity? Do you think this this search for this need for redemption is sort of coming from that, or do you think it's more universal? Our sort of need for longing for search for some sort of redemption? I mean, I wish I could say it was universal, but like <laughs> you know, we've seen. <laughs> In the past four years, some um, pretty appalling behavior by people who I I don't think seem all that invested in doing better. Um, but no, I I do of course I I think it's an incredibly human human impulse to 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 change and to improve and to and to, and to connect. You know we you know th that's one of the you know in a in a year of such suffering, you know, that's one of the sources of suffering is that we've been, we've been kept apart from other human beings so much. Right. And I, and I like how you just underscored that, that idea, you know, you, you, you just mentioned a second ago, this idea that if we just go confess, it's, it's, it's all taken care of, but well, maybe it's not that simple. Maybe true redemption does require making that connection, apologizing to those you know, against whom you've transgressed and, and that connection is actually a key part of redemption versus just going, saying you're sorry and, and hoping to do better in the future. But no, there, there's another element there and that, that is that connection, I think. I, I like that, that notion. So speaking of connection, as Amadeo prepares to seek redemption, he's um, through, through this crucifixion, through this ritual, his main concern is actually Angel. It is actually his daughter. He says, or he's thinking again, quote, more than anyone, he realizes he wants Angel to see what he's capable of. So we've already mentioned that um, Angel is his daughter, that she's pregnant, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about their relationship and kind of about her, her circumstances and her situation at, when, we, when we meet up with her? Yeah, I mean, Angel was such a fun character for me to write. She's she's really lively and funny, and she, um, you know, like like all teenagers, she really passes judgment on on the adults around her. Um, when she shows up on her grandmother's doorstep, Amadeo's doorstep, um, she has just had a big fight with her mother, and she's 
decided she's moving out and she's going to move in with her dad and her grandmother. Without letting um, them know. They don't know she's coming. She just shows up. She just shows up. Yeah. Right. She makes her mom drive her. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, her mother's house is not safe for her. Um, her mother has this boyfriend <clears throat> and the, the house is not safe for her. And so she leaves and, um, yeah, and and Angel, when the novel opens, is very pregnant, and she's enrolled in a teen parent program, um, a, a high school equivalency program, where she's working toward her GED and also learning about you know infant development and um, you know parenting skills and and life skills, job skills. Um, so, and she's very, very invested in this program and in the classroom and her, in her friends there, and she loves her teacher. Um, she's really committed to making a better life right. for her son. Right, and, and something that struck me about her that I really liked about her, <clears throat> excuse me, because she was a fun character and an interesting character that whom I, I really grew to love more and more as as the novel went on. But what struck me initially was because at first I wasn't sure, you know, she shows up, she's her life's kind of in disorder and I wasn't sure um, how I was going to feel about her. But as the novel goes on, I liked her more and more. But one thing that I really appreciated about her sort of from the get go was even though she's a teenager, she's I think like you just said, I think she was 15 when the, when the novel novel starts, she I was surprised by how aware she was of how things were supposed to be relative to the fact that she's a teenager and she has these adults who are supposed to be playing certain roles and they're not. And, and she knows her parents should be concerned about her welfare and she knows it's wrong that they're not. So for example, she after, shortly after she gets to her grandmother and father's house, really her grandmother's house where her father's living, um, she's thinking, and the quote is, here she is in Las Penas, she scrolls through her text to see if she missed one from her mom. Not one single person knows where she is right now. She is a minor. Shouldn't someone be keeping an eye out for her? But further, she says, or she also realizes again that she needs the adult guidance. She says, um, and this is after her mom finds out she's pregnant. She's thinking, quote, maybe her mother would start behaving like an actual mother, ground her, keep her safe in the house. And Angel would have no choice but to get off this increasingly troubling train she's found herself on. So given the world she finds herself in, given her age, can you tell us a little bit about how Angel came to sort of have that maturity and that self-awareness? Because I'm not sure that all teenagers would be thinking, you know, my mom should be grounding me and my dad should be there for me. They might just as likely be thinking, yeah, leave me alone. I can do what the hell, what, you know, whatever the hell I want to. So I really appreciated that self-awareness and that maturity. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you know, Angel, Angel, had to take on responsibility from a very young age. She grew up with her mother, um, who was also a young mother. And, um, you know, Angel shouldered a lot of responsibility early on. She was her mother's friend and confidant and, um, you know, took care of half the housework. And, um, you know, she considers herself her mother's equal and pal. Um, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think, you know, the idea of taking on responsibility is pretty familiar for her. Um, at the same time, as you point out, yeah, she's, she needs support. She's in a really scary moment. She's about to have this baby and be res totally responsible for his life. And she's afraid of that. And she, she's impatient with the adults. I mean, she shows up on her father's doorstep and he has shown, you know, no sign for her entire life that he's going to be very dependable. And she shows up and she demands his support. And even as she demands his support, she's not sure. She's not sure she's going to be able to stay here. She acts as if, right? But she, the whole time she's wondering and she's hoping, look, if I act as if I belong in this house, then they're not going to know any different and they're going to let me stay here. But at the same time, she, she's worried about whether that's the case. And she also doesn't feel she can go back to her mom's. So she's in a really tricky situation. Now, on the other side, both her mom and her dad realize they also realize that they've let her down and they also feel badly about it. And they also want to reconcile with her. They want to do right by her. So again, I think we return to this theme of redemption this time, you know, in a different context and this time, Marissa looking for it for the first. So Marissa is, is her mom uh, looking for that relative to her 
to her daughter. So, so, so that's interesting. But what's also interesting to me, though, kind of the next step in this idea of redemption is that a lot of these characters involved in this, they also feel a need and even, well, they feel that they're supposed to suffer. And I thought it was really interesting, this relationship between suffering and redemption. So Amadeo is even proud of suffering, right? We've already talked about how he reenacts the crucifixion and asks for nails. Um, you know, he, Amadeo is, quote, Amadeo is proud of himself because even though he hurts so bad, this is during the crucifixion ritual, he's about to hurt worse. So there's this idea that suffering is good. Angel also feels that she should suffer. Quote, Angel had a sense she should suffer for her mistakes and see them through. When he's carrying the cross up the mountain, we've already talked about how there's a bunch of people behind him doing the, the self-flagellation thing. So can you, can you share your thoughts on this connection between suffering and redemption? I mean, is the implication, I guess, at least from the perspective of the characters, that we or they need to or have to suffer before they can, they can be redeemed? Is, is suffering a precursor to redemption? You know, I think I think these characters are suffering anyway. You know, I I think Amadeo with you know his addiction and his his sense that he doesn't really have a place in the world and um you know in his sense that he's failed in in so many enterprises and you know that is suffering that is suffering i think i think what he goes through um on good friday is just a more obvious physical manifestation of that of of that suffering the pain that he he already is going through um and i think there's something really empowering for him in choosing it in in that moment um you know when angel says that she has the sense that she needs to suffer for her mistakes i think you know that's a that's a sort of shame and self-loathing that she's taken on um you know that because she's she had sex and you know that she that this baby and this this responsibility is a kind of punishment mm -hmm. um you know later she she pushes against that and right you know um that idea but yeah, and I think I think that kind of shame is all around us. You know, um, young women, girls are are steeped in that kind of shame, and so you know, it's no wonder that Angel absorbs it. Right, right. So there's someone we've talked about. Amadeo chooses that to, 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 to sort of put his suffering on display. And like you said, it's really empowering that that, that that is his choice. And then he takes it one step further. So he there is some empowerment there clearly. Um, and and there's something something to be said for, for doing that publicly. But at the same time, there, there's a character who actually chooses to suffer in silence. And so I thought she kind of was a nice juxtaposition in so far as how we and how the characters kind of deal with the suffering and, and as it relates to redemption. And that, that of course, is Yolanda. She's not, and so Yolanda is Amadeo's mother, Angela's grandmother. She's not quite above the fray, but because she has to sort of keep things together. But um, can, can you just tell us a little, a little bit about her? and her role in, in all of this and her experience suffering in silence as well, I guess. Yeah, so Yolanda is the matriarch of the family and she um, she holds everything together. I mean, certainly she holds Amadeo together. Um, she supports him. She's the, you know, she has a, a long-term job and, you know, so she's, she's supporting the entire family um, and, it's not a spoiler to to say that you, you know in the beginning of the novel she discovers that she has a brain tumor and that she won't live for for very long um and so she is has to come to terms with um the fact that she's at the end of her life and and her awareness that she's not going to be able to take care of everybody for that much longer and, you know, so how is she going to leave her son and her granddaughter and her her brand new great grandson? 
um, she has a lot of anxiety about that. At the same time, Yolanda changes. Yolanda, Yolanda decides to keep her cancer a secret from her family and, and not necessarily to protect them. She, she tells herself that it's to protect them, but she's also just holding it close to, as she, she longs for the privacy. She longs, um, you know, to, to deal with this thing on her own, um, with, without, without having to deal. And I think she's, she, she fears, and I think she's right in fearing that if she tells them, then she's going to have to deal with, you know, their grief and their worry. They're going to make it their experience. Yeah. They're going to make it their experience. Yeah. Definitely. Comfort me because you're about to die is what it's going to become. Right. Right. Exactly. And she, she rankles against that. You know, she's like, when is it my turn? So she decides to keep it a secret, which is uh, really tricky, obviously. And yet she does long for it not to be a secret. So there are a couple of examples where she's, uh, she gets pulled over by the cops and, uh, she, and so she's hoping that at the hospital, they've put her in some sort of database because she's not supposed to be driving. Cause like you said, it's a, it's a brain tumor. She's not supposed to be driving. She is driving because part of keeping the secret is continuing to go to work and continuing to live as if nothing's changed. When she gets pulled over by the police, she's hoping they'll find her in this database and that she'll be busted and the secret will be out. When she's in a grocery store, quote, a girl with bleached hair barely glances at Yolanda as she scans her groceries. I'm dying, Yolanda imagines telling her. I'm I'm dying, she imagines telling, you know, this clerk. So I'm wondering, and you've already mentioned confession. We've already mentioned confession a couple confession a couple times in the context of redemption. And so thinking about Yolanda's experience, I was wondering, does redemption require, again from the perspective of the of the characters, or just in general, I guess, not only that you suffer, which we just talked about, but that your suffering be witnessed. I mean, because she's dying to be seen, even though she wants to keep it secret because she does want to have something for herself and not have it taken over by, by the other generations. At the, at the same time, she's longing for it to be shared with someone. Yeah, I think she, she longs to be seen, you know, and, and she really hasn't been. She's, she's seen as, um, you know, the, the cook, the one who keeps everything together and as not much more than that. You know, her her son, her daughter, her granddaughter, um, no one's very curious about about her experience. Um, in fact, there, there's one moment when um, Amadeo is thinking about how his mother just always manages to pull together these elaborate, tasty dinners with no effort at all. And of course, right. like, no effort. That's that's his his point of view. Of course, right. it takes a huge amount of effort. And, um, but he doesn't see that. And um, yeah, I think I think Yolanda's like all of us in in longing to be seen. So let's shift gears. I mean, there's so much more we could talk about the book itself and other themes. And there, there are several characters who are really important to the narrative that I just couldn't fit into an hour. So, so thank you for that. But let's, let's shift gears now and talk uh, a little bit about craft. You, there's a quote uh, from you on your agency's website that I'm going to throw your way and ask you to speak to because I, I really liked it, really resonated with me and I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Um, and it is, quote, what fuels my fiction is uncertainty, not understanding things. I'm writing into uncertainty. So whether it's this book, whether it's The Five Wounds, or whether it's your stories and your other writing or just writing in general, can you share some of your thoughts on what, what you meant by that, writing into uncertainty? Yes, you know, I, I'm not a writer who um, plans plans her stories. I never have an outline. I tried it once and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it, it didn't work for me. If I knew where the story, when I knew where the story was going, um, it was no fun. There was no mystery. That. There was no I discovery. That. I was just filling in the blanks. Uh -huh. Um, so for me, I, I, I need that mystery. Um, in order to write, I need to not know what's happening and I need to be dying to know <laughs> what's mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I, I'm discovering who the characters are as I write. I'm discovering what the, the 
conflict is and what the, the mysteries are as I write. And, um, you know, I sort of feel like I'm just following, following a thread and following my, my curiosity. Um, and, you know, I, I don't always know what a story means or what, you know, it, it, hopefully there are layers of meaning and that there, you know, there are, are contradictions and, um, yeah. But you don't necessarily start off saying, for example, with this book, you didn't start off saying, I want to write a novel about redemption, for example. You were more, it was more organic, right? It was more organic. It was like, wait, that story's not quite finished. There's more to explore there. I'm not necessarily even sure what that is. So let me just jump into it and see what happens. It sounds like, if I may put words into your mouth. Absolutely. I mean, I knew, of course, you know, because I'd written the story, um, I knew that the relationship between Amadeo and Angel was going to be the the central relationship and i was interested to see how that would evolve and um and how they would you know i i did have a sense that i i wanted i wanted things to be better by the end of the novel for them so mm -hmm. i was writing toward that but i didn't i i didn't know how they would get there right I love that you said, you know, you have no outline because so many practitioners, writing coaches, whatever, will say, you've got to have an outline. You've got to have an outline. I noticed just when, when I wrote, wrote my first novel, which never saw the light of day because I didn't have an outline, it went everywhere and I wasn't able to get to the end. So then when I wrote my second novel, which is the novel I actually published, for me, it was middle ground. I needed, I realized that for my process, I needed to have enough of a skeletal outline to get to the end, but not so much of an outline that it squashed any organic spontaneous moments because sometimes the characters are gonna do things I didn't expect. And I wanted to allow room, room for that. So when you say, for example, that you don't use an outline and some people say you have to, whatever, my conclusion, and I'm just curious your thoughts on this, is that there's not one process, that it's finding your own process and going with it. That's kind of what I've concluded. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, I know writers who write wonderful books who write outlines and just each day they're just working their way through the outline and it works for them. Um, it doesn't work for me. I had a similar experience. I started a novel um, and I, I approached it the way I approach a short story, which is to just write and then mm -hmm. hope that the story emerges. And I wrote and wrote and wrote and had 250 pages and the story never emerged. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think actually I'm, I'm with you, um, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit, a little bit of structure. Yeah. I knew for the five wounds, I knew that it would take place over the course of a year. That, right. that choice I made pretty early on. I knew that I wanted um, Amadeo and Angel to have a kind of reconciliation at the end of that year. Um, I knew because, you know, I, I know how babies grow. <laughs> that, 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 you know, Connor would go through certain developmental stages over the right. course of that year. So, you know, there was, there, there was enough there to sort of keep me you know, it's like bumpers on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you just said something that was actually, or is my next question, or you just touched on it. And so I'd like to explore this a little further. So as we've already talked about, um, you know, this, this novel started off as a short story. And as you just alluded to a moment ago, the, those are two very different forms, the short story versus the novel. So can you tell us a little bit just about your process of taking what was a short story originally and turning it into a novel? Because I would assume there were some challenges and then I would assume there were some, there's some liberty, right? Because you've got all this, you've got all these, so much more space to, to work with. So can you tell us kind of about both sides of that coin of making the jump from a short story and turning it into a novel? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't know that I will ever do this again. Um, <laughs> okay, interesting, um, interesting, yeah. It, it, I, I did it because I cared about these characters. I still had a lot of questions about them. And, and I was finding that I was writing about basically these same characters in other stories uh, with, you know, under other names. So there was something about that dynamic yep. I was still interested in. Um, you know, because the story was published, it was available on the internet, it was in my collection, it had a kind of permanence and wholeness to it that 
for a long time was really hard for me to work with. And mm -hmm. I had to get to the stage where I, I allowed myself to just break it. Um, I, I had to say, okay, that story exists. Um, but for the purposes of this novel, I, I can smash it and take what I want from it and discard what isn't useful. And so, yeah, I mean, there are characters in there, uh, one, one major character in the story that doesn't appear in the novel. And, um, so yeah, I think for me, sort of forgetting that it was, I mean, is, does exist as a cohesive whole um, in the world, uh, you know, once I had to forget that and let myself um, break it open. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I had the freedom to, to really play with it. Yeah, it just, it sounds daunting because it, it's so hard to finish something, right? It's so hard to put the bow on the final package. And so then, and like you said, it's out in the world and it's, it's been well received. And so now to go back, I could see how, I mean, I like that metaphor that you keep using, you know, breaking it open. Um, so yeah, I could, I can understand how that must have been daunting, but at the same time, you know, clearly has paid, paid off. One question, another craft question I had. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really empathize with Amadeo at first, right? I mean, he's sort of a deadbeat. He keeps making these horrible decisions. He's living off his mom and she's, she's got her own stuff going on. But as the novel progresses, I really did start to empathize with him. But interestingly, for me at least, it wasn't because he suddenly turns his life around. I mean, he does make improvements. He does, you know, he is slowly figuring it out. I mean, so he definitely evolves, mm -hmm. but he's still making some horrible, horrible decisions. So we need our characters. We want our characters to transform over the course. I mean, that's, that's kind of where we're writing, right? Is to see these transformations. Was it tricky? I'm just curious. Was it, you know, was it tricky for someone who, uh, was it tricky to carry out his transformation in a way that where he wasn't necessarily empathetic and maybe other people thought he was, maybe I'm just heartless, but was it tricky to make someone who wasn't necessarily empathetic up front to get the reader to empathize as the novel went on? I mean, empathizing with Amadeo was probably the biggest challenge for me at the very beginning like uh -huh. in, the, in the story. Um, by the time I started the novel, I, I already, was quite attached to him, but that was part of your motivation for the novel. It sounds like, yeah, yeah. But you know, in the beginning, yeah, he's, he's hard to love. He, he has let the people down in his life over and over and over. And that's, that's hard to love. Um, I think what, what does make me root for him, what does make me love him is that he wants to change right. and that desire you know, I, I can't help but but root for somebody who wants to be better. And, um, you know, and I, I tell my students that, like the, the quickest way to get a reader on the side of your character is to give them something to want. And, mm. you know, it doesn't always matter. You know, it doesn't have to be an ethical thing. It doesn't have to be a, a valuable thing necessarily. Um, I think we're inclined to just root for, for characters. I mean, and, for Amadeo, I think it actually is a, a good thing to want to be a better dad and, and person in the world. Um, Certainly. But yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I do appreciate that you, you did get on his side. I mean, I did. I, I did. For that. Well, and that's, and that's why, like I said, I mean, it was kind of a tricky question to ask, but thank, thank, thank you for getting it. But, but yeah, I just thought that was kind of tricky because he's not, I didn't empathize for him in the beginning and by the end I did. And it would, but, it, and it was just very subtle and slow, you know, and gradual how it happened. You know, it wasn't like all of a sudden he does, he didn't find that one moment where he's redeemed, you know, that would have easily enabled me to suddenly empathize. I mean, it was much more gradual, much more nuanced than that, which is why I was curious about that. So thanks for that. So slogan of the conference, so we've just talked about craft, the slogan of the San Francisco Writers Conference, craft, community, and commerce. And so I would like to talk briefly about community also, just quickly. It has been uh, over a year, I'm trying to remember when that was, it's been over a year since the American Dirt controversy, right? And I was just, I just jumped on Twitter last night and did a little poking around and I got a statistic from Latin Pitch, which is a group of 12 writers working to foment uh, Latinx representation in, in publishing. They noted that 
uh, Latinx Americans make up 18.4% of the United States population, but only 6% of the workforce in publishing. They also noted that out of 708 books on best of lists in 2020, only 22 were Latinx, which is more or less 3%. When I was getting ready to do the programming for, for the podcast, for this podcast, and I was looking at the 2021 um, you know, upcoming books to be on the lookout for lists. The one I found you on in your book was, uh, you know, out of 55 books on that list, I think there were only three that were Latinx. Yours, of Women in Salt by Gabriel Garcia, My Broken Language by Chiara Alegria Udes. So do you feel in the past year since, since that, you know, the initial controversy that started spawning more conversation about Latinx representation in publishing and writing, have we, have we, have we made progress? Are we going in the right direction? What are some of your general thoughts on that? Well, I think certainly, you know, attention was was drawn to the issue, which is is important. Um, you know, like like you said, uh, you know, eighteen four eighteen point four percent of the population. Like that's that's a lot of people, and okay. you know, and I do think there are ways in which, you know. Latinx experience is still seen by, you know, white, white America to be marginalized. And it's not, it is an American experience. And, you know, it was, in, it was important to me that my book be positioned as an American novel, a book about an American family. Um, that because, because it is. <laughs> like you said, they've been here hundreds of years. The border moved, not, not them, right? Yeah, and I think there's, there are often, you know, it's often a misconception that, you know, we're all recent immigrants. There's a mis, you know, we heard from the, um, the, the last president, um, you know, who, who saw us not only as, you know, only recent immigrants, but, you know, really, really vilified us as, as being, you know, illegals and criminals. And, you know, it's, it's appalling. And I, but I, I think that that's not uncommon. Um, and the fact is that, you know, there, there are so, so many different Latinx experiences. Like, you know, it's, it's a vast swab um, that we're looking at. Right. And so, of course, of course, I want, you know, literature to reflect those experiences. I want to read about those. Um, you know, there's so many that I know nothing about um, Latinx experiences, and I, I'm curious. So, yeah, I think, gosh, I want more. <laughs> okay, that's that's a good place to, to 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 wrap that up. And one place people can start to help with that is to buy your book, which happens to already be out. Um, Kirsten, there's so much more I would love to ask you, but we have sort of found our way to the end of of our hour. So, thank you very much for being here today, and um, continued success with the book. It's it's doing so well, and I'm I'm really happy for you. And like I said. Um, just, yeah, just congratulations. And, and I wish you continued success. Uh, do you want to show people the book? The Five Wounds is out now. So uh... sure, I'd love to. I, I love this cover that Norton gave me. I love that cover, too. There it is. There it is. The Five Wounds by Kirsten Valdez Quaid. Please go check it out. Uh, for more about the book and about Kirsten, you can go to KirstenValdezQuaid.com and also check out. I noticed that Roxanne Gay's Audacious Book Club is featuring your book. When is it? July. So, Bye. so check out Roxanne, participate in, in the book club. I don't know exactly how that works, but check that out. Uh, thank you again, Kirsten. I'm Matthew Felix. For more about me, for more about me you can go to matthewfelix.com. And for more about the San Francisco Writers Conference, uh, including details about the expanded new uh, writing contest for this year and lots of upcoming virtual events, you can go to sfwriters.org. Until next time, thanks for joining us.